today we have Dr. Jack Burks, neurologist, uh, and Dr. Mark Casserone, neurologist. We have them here today uh, to talk about the, the neurologist's perspective in CCSVI research. Uh, Dr. Casserone, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, thanks, Sharon. Uh, my name is Mark Casserone. I'm the medical director of the South Tampa Multiple Sclerosis Center in Tampa, Florida. Uh, and I've been able to be involved in a number of different research protocols uh, in multiple sclerosis as the primary investigator, um, done primarily through some of the different pharmaceutical companies uh, in the States. I opened up the center in 2001. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Burks, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? I'm a neurologist uh, with specific training in multiple sclerosis and I've been involved in a number of MS centers throughout the country and a number of clinical trials and I'm also the uh, Chief Medical Officer of the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America. Okay, thank you. Um, let's just uh, try uh, today just uh, focus on two different aspects of CCSVI, MS, and uh, the perspective from uh, the neurology um, discipline. Uh, first, uh, what would you suggest, how can the patients approach the neurologist in an effective way when talking about, uh, or talking about CCSVI? Uh, Dr. Cassione, would you like to go ahead? Uh, sure. I think really just uh, patients need to be able to feel comfortable having an open conversation with their doctor or their nurse practitioner, uh, whoever's helping them take care of their multiple sclerosis. Um, there may very well be doctors who don't have a good concept of what CCSVI is and whether or not it even has any relation to multiple sclerosis. So possibly a gentle way of introducing it uh, without um, making neurologists necessarily feel ignorant about a concept that isn't really well ed, you know, studied at this point uh, would be the, the first step. Um, maybe a short paper or two or something from the internet uh, just so there's a general introduction and just maybe saying, you know what, I don't know if this is something that's pertinent for me as a patient with MS, but if you as my doctor think that it might be worthwhile to look into, maybe you know a way that I can you know, have this evaluated uh, in a good, safe way. Um, so I think uh, just a, a clean, easy, non-confrontational kind of way like that would probably be best. <laughs> well, I think the neurologist is at a disadvantage because as neurologist, uh, we pride ourselves on being something called evidence-based medicine people. Uh, we want the data. We want to say, you know, we've been through a lot of cures, probably a hundred cures for MS that didn't make it. Uh, and so we're at a disadvantage when we don't have a lot of scientific data to back up. We have some preliminary data. Some looks positive. Some looks negative. So it's hard for us to put that into perspective because we don't have the clinical trials that are adequate scientifically to, to make any sort of judgment. Secondly, uh, would you, um, how do you best see the research going forward and what do you see the role as the neurologist within the research for CCSVI? Dr. Um, Cassion? Yeah, Dr. Brooks and I were talking about this a little bit just before. Um, we think it's important for the, uh, the neurologist, uh, the patient, and the interventional radiologist all to really get together. It really can't be done in one camp or the other from the radiology camp or necessarily only from the neurology camp as well. Um, so um, studies need to be um, well conceived, controlled uh, with appropriate patients that actually have a clear diagnosis of MS uh, and meet certain appropriate inclusion, exclusion criteria, and they need to be followed in terms of what their neurologic condition is initially and how it progresses or doesn't progress or changes at all, uh, whether there's any type of intervention that's done or if it's just an investigational type of uh, research study looking at whether or not there is any association between venous flow obstruction and multiple sclerosis or venous flow obstruction and any neurological condition um, just as a, as a basis. Now, there, it almost seems like there's a turf battle, uh, a, a confrontation between the uh, interventional radiologists and endovascular surgeons and the neurologist where the interventional radiologists say yes we should do this, everybody should have this and the neurologists are saying well what's the data to support that? The, to put these people in harm's way, to cost them a lot of money, so where's the data? But in fact, I don't think there should be a turf battle. 
because if you look at the recommendation of the Society of Inter Interventional Radiologists, the leadership, they have five or six points that basically says, one, there's no proven value for this yet. It's, it's still in the, in the pilot study stage. Uh, second, we need more research. Third, we need a registry to, to, to follow these patients because if we don't know what happens to the patients, it's hard to know what the value is long term. And there are a number of other things that, if you ask the neurologist, they'd say exactly the same thing. So the fact is, the two groups are thinking alike. And the key comes up, sometimes I think, to the commercialization versus the science. Which comes first? Uh, do we, we treat 400,000 patients with MS in the United States and then see what happens? Or do we treat 100 patients carefully selected uh, and, and develop guidelines of, of whether these procedures are appropriate for MS patients or not? And I think the neurologist and interventional radiologists are actually together in this. They really want to see the science before the commercialization. Dr. Castillo, do you have any remark there? No, I, I, I think that's, that's uh, very appropriate. Um, we need to be able to go forward to be able to analyze um, the different aspects of CCSVI and what relationship it does or does not have with MS, uh, not only on a a basic kind of pathological basis, uh, but also on a more day-to-day, -day, how does this affect the patient in terms of his or her symptoms uh, from MS. Um, and that can only be done uh, over a relatively long period of time in terms of study, maybe one or two years or even longer, um, with the appropriate subjects uh, and good clinical sound uh, evaluations uh, that uh, be, are there from the beginning and continue on. Um, there are a lot of uh, different treatments for MS, as Dr. Brooks mentioned, that have come and gone and failed miserably, even though they may have had um, really good preliminary data. But when you get the uh, subjects that are appropriate to really evaluate it, take it beyond the rat level or whatever, and go into large numbers of people, that's when we get some of our best answers. Um, and short of those good clinical uh, radiological studies, we're just scratching our heads and we don't have a good way to um, advise our patients. We want to be able to provide for them uh, ways that they can maximize their health, their neurological function. We all took an oath above all, do no harm, and we want to be sure that uh, the patient's best interest is really at heart. Um, and I think that's the bottom line for everyone, neurologists, radiologists, cardiologists. Um, I'm going to throw out uh, another... May, may just, okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my biggest disappointments in, in this whole field since CCSVI has, uh, has come on the horizon is the perception that neurologists um, are negative, not about the procedure, but about patients. And that's very disappointing to me because the neurologists really do want what want what's best for the patients. Uh, and that the what's best for the patient, we're not going to know until we do the research. Uh, at the same time, if, if this were the cure for multiple sclerosis, I can tell you the neurologist would be very happy. Because uh, we're all very interested in our patients and we're interested in the welfare of our patients. Uh, but if we find out it may not work and it may actually be harmful uh, to certain patients, well we need to know that too. Uh, so what we're just looking for is information that can help us guide our patients to the best outcomes. I'm thinking here uh, of another question. Dr. Castillon, have you been surprised about the patients and the Internet and how this has uh, moved? Blossomed? Yes. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> yes and no. Um, I learned when I started doing a lot of MS work over 10 years ago that probably out of all different neurological conditions, the people with multiple sclerosis are the most kind of hooked up with each other and with the internet and with what some may consider to be fringe treatments that may not have a lot of scientific merit behind them, whether it be bee stings or hyperbaric oxygen or any other kinds of sometimes treatments that are in vogue for a period of time and then may go away. Um, so it didn't necessarily surprise me that after a TV show in Canada, like the whole world quickly found out about uh, this condition, and I heard about it first from a patient of mine who came in and said, hey, I want to have a liberation procedure. And I said, uh, you want to have a what? You know. Uh, so anyway, so then we started talking, and it was from a patient that I heard, which is usually the case for all of things like, like that, whether it's low-dose naltrexone or 
you know, or pro camera <coughs> or, or, or what have you. I hear about it from the patients, you know, and then we, we find out about it. Um, so I wasn't necessarily surprised, but in the past year, it's just been um, amazing how much it really has blossomed in terms of, um, you know, people's interests. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when more research has been um, going on, whether it be up in New York or in California or whatever, beyond what might have started in Italy, um, it, it's lending more credence to the fact that we're starting to at least glean some information about it, which we didn't have beyond Dr. Zamboni's mm -hmm. 65 MS patients initially. Okay. Dr. My Burke? most pleasant experience with this whole thing has been um, the, um, the unification of, of the data with the CCSVI Alliance, the patient organization, which is a very fair and balanced, both sides just will give you the facts, uh, will give you the data that says it doesn't work, will give you the data that says it does work, uh, so you're, you're familiar with that. And that, that's been very different, because in the past, when we've had snake venom and bee stings and stuff like that, the patients have usually been on one side, that they're, they're the gung-ho against the doctors. Well, there's a patient organization, CCSV Alliance, that's actually saying, we want to provide balanced information. And so people who read, go to that website, actually can understand both sides. And that, to me, has been a, a very positive experience uh, for me. Getting back to what something Dr. Uh, Burks had mentioned earlier, there does seem to be a perception that if, if a patient is told no by his or her neurologist that treatment X or Y or Z isn't good for that person, then the neurologist is a bad individual. The neurologist doesn't care about me because he said no. Clearly, if he cared about me, he would want me to try anything I can because I have a progressive neurological condition. That's just not always the case. It is possible to do harm to people with some of the stuff that, that's out there that isn't well researched. And um, I think it really, it really, I, I, know, I know Dr. Brooks well, and, and for myself personally, I know that we kind of are almost hurt personally as, as, as individuals, as, as human beings, when a patient assumes that simply because we don't recommend a particular treatment that may have some risk to it, that we don't have their best interests in heart. We, that's exactly what we do have. Um, we're, we're trying to offer good sound advice for people that, that's based on, on good evidence-based medicine, not just what's an in vogue uh, phenomenon or interest. Uh, so, okay. I, I think one of the reasons for uh, for talking about this is to actually get the interventional doctors and the neurologists together so that they, patients can actually be evaluated in a systematic way uh, because the interventional radiologists are very good at what they do and the neurologists are very good at what they do and one of the things we're very good at is evaluating patients. So having the two working together, especially um, with the influence of the patient groups saying this is, this is where, where we need to go, these are the questions that we have. It's a great combination, and I'm looking forward to those collaborations. Do you, I think we're almost 15 minutes, um, so I think we can go ahead and close. I want to thank you both for taking the time out this afternoon to speak with us, and um, look forward to posting this on our website. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you for the invitation.